morning, everybody, and a very, very warm welcome to another one of Yeshiva College's talks. Over the last year, and I was just talking to Jody about it, we've just had the incredible privilege of being able to have speakers, um, and especially international speakers from all over the world, coming to bring our Yeshiva College and broader community just a whole lot of interesting talks and facts and um, ideas that um, aren't limited to, to Johannesburg. Um, unfortunately, Jody's parents are both in hospital with COVID and bears Rat Hashem in the merit of her. First of all, thank you so much for, for agreeing to do this talk, Jody. And he's at this, at this difficult time, but in, your, in the merit of your giving and, and giving us of your wisdom and kindness, um, your parents, uh, Shmuel ben, um, ben Leah and Esther Bat Rachel, should just have a full and complete recovery. And you so far away should just be at peace. Um, <laughs> and you have no more worries. And uh, just thank you very much. We find ourselves in the period of Sfirata Omer at the moment. It's almost like a, you know, we, we it's, it's spoken about um, Barab Soloveitchik almost as a, uh, a Chola Moed between Pesach and Shavuot, a long, long period. But it's a period where we, it's spoken about as something of, uh, of a time for Tikkun Midot, where we can really, really have an opportunity to introspect and look at ourselves and look at our lives and say, now that we have celebrated Pesach and try to unshackle ourselves, um, so we've, we've gone out of the difficulty, but the question is where to? And we know we are going towards Shavuot and towards Torah, but um, Baruch Hashem, we just launched a uh, um learning tonight in, in our girls' high school in the merit of the Rosh Hashiva. And one of the things I learned with my daughter was about the reason why Pirkei Avot starts with uh, Moshe is because the Torah always has to come with humility. And humility comes when we really look at ourselves and understand where we're at and see where we're going. And I don't think there's any better person than, than Jody with her experience as a mom of a special needs child, as an author, a speaker, an entrepreneur, a traveler, a disability advocate, to come and talk to us about how to ensure that we do not ever limit ourselves and that the world is our oyster and that our thinking should always, should never be um, in Mitzrayim with uh, mates up with boundaries, but rather should really be expansive as Torah is. The Torah was given in, in a desert without any boundaries. Um, it, it, you know, it wasn't given in a specific country where anyone could say it is there, but rather it is a Torah for the world. So Jody, thank you so, so much for your time. We look so forward to your talk and uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Okay. So thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to the whole Mizrahi team, to Yeshiva College and all of you guys behind the scenes who made this happen. And for me, speaking to South Africans is definitely one of my favorite audiences because it's like comfort food. And I can say words that Americans don't understand, that I don't have to translate myself. And I'm really like the girl from Johannesburg. I grew up in Glen Hazel my whole life. And I was really this shy girl that probably most people didn't even know existed. Um, in fact, my claim to fame was my mother taught at Yeshiva College for 20 years in the elementary school. So everybody, people would be, oh, you're like Mrs. Newman's daughter. Um, and thank you for mentioning my parents who are both crazy, like sick with COVID and they're both in high care and we really need them to have a refer Shalema. So we appreciate everybody's Tehillim for Shmuel Ben Leia and Esther Bat Rachel. <sighs> so <laughs> with that, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my journey and I'm gonna frame the talk because my journey is what makes me realize um, the, my journey starting in Glen Hazel in Johannesburg as a non-religious girl to where I am now um, frames the whole concept of tonight's talk about having a mission statement for parenting. So I did not grow up religious, but on a Saturday morning, my family, we grew up in Glen Hazel in the heart of the ghetto we would be getting in and out our car on a Saturday morning. And we always would have all these kids from Yeshiva College walking past and they'd be like, 
good Shabbos, Mrs. Newman. And I was like, wow, those nerds, those religious kids, the army army. I was like, never, ever, no matter what, I was never going to be like one of them. Little did I know towards the end of high school, I'd go to Eden College. And one day on the school bus, a cute guy said, so will I see you until tonight? I'm like, sure. Don't they give good Shabbos kisses at all? Okay, I'll go to shul. Like, you never know, you'll see the cute guy in shul. And that was the beginning of my Jewish journey. And I started investigating the religious world. All my friends were going to Israel for their gap year after high school. My parents were like dead against it, but finally acquiesced and let me go. And I was in Israel for just a few weeks and the Gulf War broke out. So now I'm aging myself, but the Gulf War broke out and I landed up going to London where through a series of coincidences where Yeshiva College plays a big part. My mother was speaking in the staff room to one of the, she was talking about the fact that I'm in London and I didn't want to come home and I didn't want to waste my year. And um, Naomi Fachler, um, the late Mordechai, Rabbi Mordechai Fachler's wife said, um, you know, my in-laws live in London, maybe they would host her. I went there. They offered me food. I said I wasn't hungry. They insisted I eat a meal. And that meal became the basis of a lifelong friendship and, and a, a relationship that really influenced my whole life. And I always used to say to Mrs. Fackler that I don't know how to give back to them to say thank you for everything. I didn't even have money in those days to buy like a bottle of wine. And they said, one day you should pay it forward. And I don't think they would ever imagine that this would be a gift that keeps giving. And as a volunteer, I run a not-for-profit organization in Jerusalem, in Tel Aviv, in New York. We have over 10,000 people a year come through the door. And we've just celebrated a 132nd marriage through our events. And I actually dedicated my book, Chutzpah, Wisdom and Wine to Mrs. Fakhla. So I left London after the Gulf War. I landed up in the Bay Yerushalayim. I didn't even understand what a black hat institution meant. I landed up getting expelled. I went backpacking in Europe, coming home with a heavy backpack to the old city of Jerusalem. I was walking up all the stairs when this cute soldier, tall, dark and handsome, offered to carry my bags. And you know, I, he was, we landed up meeting and talking for five hours. And he was like the most interesting person I had ever met. I mean, I'd come from Jewish Johannesburg, where everyone looks the same, dressed the same, aspires for the same car, same vacation, always the same latest jewelry. You know what I'm talking about. And he was like the most interesting person. And here I am at age 18, I've swung the pendulum from like not religious, and then I'm religious, and then I'm in a black hat yeshiva, and then I'm not religious. And now, he was from Kiryat Arba, um, outside of Hebron, and we were going to be hilltop kids and live in a caravan somewhere. And th th this was Jody's plan. And my parents were horrified. They thought I'd been kidnapped by a cult. And I was just a idealistic but somewhat confused 18-year-old when I was sitting on the um, streets in Ben Yehuda talking to a friend in Jerusalem when a guy walked up to me and said, excuse me, do you speak English? And guess what I said? Yeah. And he was like, oh, you're South African. And we started talking. The rest is history. I married Gavin. My parents were much, much happier. A Jewish doctor from South Africa was much more they seen than a hilltop kid in Hebron. And he spoke English. There was like lots of benefits. We had this plan to make Aliyah except we had no money, we had student loans. So we did the South African doctor track. We went to Australia and New Zealand, Gavin worked for the flying doctor service. And I mean, we lived in places in Australia that most of you guys are probably, most Australians and New Zealanders have never heard of, let alone. And we had this, you know, incredible experience. And then we landed up in a city called the Gold Coast, which, for those who've been to Australia, it's on the Eastern Seaboard and it's a city where a lot of like elderly Jews go to retire. Gavin was working as a doctor. Every time someone saw his kippah, they'd be like, oh, you know, I'm Jewish. Uh, they'll go, I'm sorry, my mom's Jewish. And Gavin will be like, oh, wow, that means you're Jewish. And they're like, I'm not Jewish, but my mother is. 
or some elderly people would come in and they would say, you know, I have a granddaughter, she's not married, she's dating a guy, whatever they, and we realized there was like this need to start running events. And we started having 30, 40 people every week in our home for Shabbat. And then we won green cards. So people all over the world, when you say you won green cards, think you're crazy because they don't know what that is. But South Africans all know about winning the green card lotto. And we moved to New York. Within three weeks of arriving in New York, someone asked me to host a Rosh Hashanah meal for foreign MBA students who had nowhere to go. They knew I hosted big meals. And I had this epiphany that foreign Jews moving to a big city like New York just needed this Jewish home away from home. And there we started our life in New York and came 2008, we were really living a good life. We had great jobs. We had two awesome kids. We were traveling all over. We had an open home. We were hosting thousands of people and we would have been called like pillars of the community. And on February 25th, 2008, I had just given birth three days before to Kayla. And we were on top of the world as any new parents would be. We had sent out a message to the whole database of my organization, Jewish International Connection, to 8,000 people at the time, mom and baby are doing well. You know, we, the room was filled with flowers and balloons. And the doctor walked in and he said the words that would change my life. He said, Mrs. Samuels, did you do genetic testing? And I just sat bolt upright. I knew, I knew where this conversation was going. I'd had a mother's intuition. You can read my whole drama in the book. If you haven't read the book, you can. But I had this whole like intuition that something was wrong. And the second he raised the suspicion, I knew he was gonna say Down syndrome. I had a cousin with Down syndrome. I was terrified by the concept of Down syndrome. And I remember like I'd go to shul at Yeshiva College and Selwyn Siegel would bring, you know, the dis people with disabilities to shul and I'd be like freaked out. I was like, you know, I was scared like most people are. And I was like, and how am I gonna like host all these guests and how am I gonna travel? And what does this mean for my kids and for their future and for their education, uh, their marriage prospects? And it like all rushes through your mind and I was like, uh, I was an aspiring businesswoman. How am I going to be on the front page of Business Week, Fortune, Forbes? I mean, I had really big goals. And I went into the bathroom and it was like one of the few places I could be alone with my thoughts. And I looked in the mirror and this was about half an hour after getting the diagnosis. And that was the moment my journey really began because it sparked those questions like, who am I? What do I really want from my life? What does God want from me by putting me in this situation? And it was probably one of the most honest conversations, probably the most honest conversation I've ever had with myself about, you know, I knew that I was Jody, the aspiring businesswoman and entrepreneur. I knew that I was Jody, mom and wife. I knew that I was Jody, the community activist. I knew that I was crazy Jody that everyone spoke about hosting a million guests and never sleeping and always being on the go. But there were bigger questions that I had to ask. I realized that I'd had two miscarriages between my middle daughter and Kayla. And I really felt that for some reason, God wanted me to have this special soul in my life. But I also had to ask myself, you know, if we're really these people who have an open home and we have this open door policy and people can walk in and out of our house. And quite literally, we lived in an apartment in Manhattan where like the door was always open, people were always in and out, so much so prompting the doorman one day to go, I, I know what you are, you, 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 you a soup kitchen. You, you're like a soup kitchen for, for single people. But it was interesting to see her perspective. But like literally we had this open door policy and I had to ask myself, how could I have this true open door policy and yet not be able to accept my own child? You know, we took the lost, the lonely, the searching, as my kids would say, the singles looking to get married. How could I not have an open home for my own daughter? And I walked out and I shared my 
thoughts with my husband and we were on the same page and we decided we were not going to be the victims. We were gonna control the message. We were gonna change people's knee jerk reaction to someone with special needs. But that doesn't mean I walked out of there like, okay, great. So God gave me a special needs child now. This is just perfect. You know, I'm not gonna be a victim. I'm gonna be an activist in the cause. We just knew that we wanted to not be victims. And at some level we had accepted the decision and we were gonna be happy because we knew as like Rabbi Jonathan Sachs always says that the, the proof of your parenting is the values you've engraved in your children. If we were gonna come home and make this child into a burden, then what kind of value system were we gonna share with our other children? Um, in the time after having my daughter, I went on lots of walks. I was very confused. I had to spend a lot of time thinking, dealing, trying to say, like, you know, why us now? Why, you know, I'm the person who volunteers. Like, you know, I'm the person who doesn't sleep at night giving to the community. I'm the person who like travels the world. I'm the person who builds relationships with people. And then I had this like epiphany moment. And I was like, as a businesswoman, not only a businesswoman, as a business coach and consultant, someone that helps so many people with their businesses, I help people write business plans. And every single business, the first question you say to people is, what is your mission statement? What is a mission statement? A mission statement is something that describes what your business is. It describes the reason why your business exists. And it defines what your business stands for. And I realized in a personal context, I needed my own mission statement. I needed to know, I needed a compass. I needed something to give me focus, direction, goals. And I knew that this would guide me. This would guide my decisions. This would help me to define my responsibilities. And this would help me become the person I wanted to be. You know, and I always would say like, I'm on a mission to change the world. And I really am. Like, I don't believe I can change the world as in change the world world, but I really believe that I can get out of bed every day and I can make a difference and I can contribute in my own little way to the world. So for each of us, a mission is unique. We all have different personalities. We have different people in our lives. We live in different places. We have different passions and we have different opportunities. So there's no two people who are gonna have exactly the same mission. But I think that as parents, the absence of having a mission statement is a problem. And the reason I say that is we want our children to be resilient. We want our children to be confident. We want our children to be perfect. We want our children to be empowered. I mean, I can go on and on. Like every parent has this list. Every Jewish parent has an extra long list, but you can go. I mean, not, nothing's brought this home as much as COVID where on Zoom, as Natalie was saying before, that you know now you can have any speaker from all over the world, you can just Google, you can get so much content. There's no shortage of information out there, but there is a shortage of meaningful knowledge. There is a shortage of being guided by that information. And you know, you have to think about it. When our parents were parenting, it was like the Dr. Spock world of parenting. When you look at it now, it's like very different world of parenting. You would never hit your kid. You would never do some of those, you know, philosophies that were definitely philosophies they lived by. Think of the food industry. First, it's, well, first it was like sugar-free. Then it's like, no, all those sugar products are terrible for you. Then it's fat-free. Then it's no frats aren't bad for you. Then it's trans fat-free. Then, then it's not bad. Now it's gluten, you know, we never knew anybody who had a gluten allergy. Now there's aisles and aisles of gluten-free products in America, I don't know, in South Africa, but suddenly like gluten's the new enemy. You can look in America at politics. 
you can watch CNN and Fox and think you're in two completely separate countries. There's no reconciling of the message whatsoever. And that's the challenge because information alone is not enough. That's why you need the mission statement because I can tell you, I mean, the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe always used to say, and I mean, I think he was one of the prime examples of a businessman who built an organization that's like a franchise with many branches. And one of his messages he always said to his shlechem was, what are you measuring? Because if you don't know what you're measuring, you don't know where you're going. And that's what a personal mission statement is because otherwise you as a parent can just keep adding to the list of everything because not only do you want your child to be resilient and confident and perfect and empowered, you could also want your kid to be kind and successful and respectful and the list can go on and on. You know, we had a like an incident, a story that really, really affected us when we were in New York. And this was before we even had thought of Aliyah. We didn't realize we we're gonna make Aliyah so soon afterwards, it's another story. But my kids went to school, we lived in Manhattan, and my kids went to school in Riverdale to what's like objectively one of the best Jewish day schools, rated highly, certainly in the New York area, was like probably like the number two school, one or two school, like an unbelievable school. And, you know, when similar to like South Africa, you know, you go to school and everybody's sort of in your similar socioeconomic cohort, you know, it's, that's the nature of private schools. And there was a documentary that was shown and it was called The Road to Nowhere. It was about a mother who was investigating why a kid in her daughter's class committed suicide at age 12 because she didn't think she was gonna get good enough grades. And she went all over the country and she spoke to kids and she gave some really interesting insights into <laughs> the challenges of modern day parenting and education. But I digress because while that's an incredibly important documentary to watch, um, and it really is, it's called The Road to Nowhere, you can get it on Amazon. One of the things that really, really freaked me out there were about 300 parents in the room. So this was like an equivalent of saying, you know, being at a Yeshiva College campus with the, you know, early learning center, elementary school and high school, all in the same parents in the same meeting. And Rabbi Dr. Pelkovitz, some of you might know him, he's a psychologist, a rabbi. He asked a question and it really freaked me out because these are the 1%, guys. These are the 1% of, the population, the ones who can give their children, you know, in America where everyone like gives their kids prenatal classes in languages to give them language aptitude. These are the kids that are given everything on a golden platter. This is the 1% that in America they protest about who have everything and they have nothing. I mean, yes, object uh, subjectively, it looks like we have everything, you know, it's like, wow, we have big houses and go to private schools. But when he said to the parents, how many of you think your children are happy, believe your children are truly happy? Out of about 300 parents in the audience, less than half the people put their hand up. Less than half the people could admit that their children are happy. And I think there is such a problem in our world because really this was all about parenting without a mission statement. This is about being successful and being resilient and being everything. But most of these kids just don't know. They don't have that framework. They don't have the values. They don't have that mission statement to guide them to be their compass. And in the Talmud, it says that it's an obligation of a father to teach the child to swim. So what does that mean? We're really talking about it's the obligation of a parent to teach their kids survival skills. And I think modern day psychology will go and talk about survival skills being, oh, you got to teach your kids, you know, emotional stability and confidence. And you know, we can go again on the list. But at the end of the day, we're missing something because the real, real teaching your kids survival skill is teaching your kids to know 
what their personal mission statement is like and to be able to value that. Because when they have a mission statement, it's therefore it doesn't matter if, you know, because one of the challenges when Dr. Polkowitz was talking about this, you know, every kid wants to be able to live in the neighborhood their parents did or one up on that and to get into university and there's 500 places but 5,000 applicants, there's like this forever never ending pressure to fulfill that list. But that, and kids want to fulfill the list. The parents want the children to fulfill it, but kids need to fulfill it as well because they feel like if they don't do that, then they're not successful. They're not part of it. They let their parents down. But really by having a personal mission statement, it gives your children a framework for life and a statement of values. And it gives them, when people have a mission and they're comfortable with their mission, that is the point at which people are happy. And as a parent, when you have your personal mission statement, you then become a beacon of light. Because when you're a parent with a very clear mission statement, your children see your passion. You know, it's everybody knows that the, the child whose parents are like into care of and excited about it are usually more into care of and excited about it because this is what their parents were into. When children know what's expected of them or when they understand what their parents are doing, they have so much more gratitude. When they can see the integrity of what their parents do and believe in, they don't have dissonance. When children see the clarity of what the parents' values are and they don't switch and change because, you know, today it was, today it's the, diet um, coke that's in and the next day actually it's the trans fats and the next day it's the gluten and I'm using a really simple analogy but it's very clear for the children because you have this set of values and like in business you usually have an annual review and you get feedback and I always think as a parent it's very worthwhile getting that feedback from your kids getting feedback from your family about you as a parent with your mission statement and also having an opportunity to build a family mission statement. What do we as a family want to achieve? What do we care about? What are our values? In Jody's voice, which is my brand and that's my website and that's what I blog under, I talk about challenging mindsets and inspiring greatness. And ultimately, mission statements change over time. But this is what I truly believe my mission in the world is. But now that I have the mission statement of challenging mindsets and inspiring greatness, it's not, you know, now I have to say, like, how do I live that life? But now I've got that mission that I measure it. If you look at a, com a company like Google, they about having as the most information in the world easily accessible. And everything they do is defined by that. And if you know what that is, you can always test where you're going. So now I know what I wanna be and what I wanna do. So if I go do something that's against that mission, I know it's wrong because it's very clear to me where I'm going. I know that I truly wanna learn. I, like, I have a unique life, but it's not just having a unique life where I've traveled to 87 countries and host thousands of people and never sleep. It's, I'm famous for only sleeping four hours a night, but that, that, that is not what drives me. I have this positive energy. I'm excited. I wake up in the morning and I know I'm gonna achieve something. I know what I'm gonna do and I know what, what I wanna do and I know where I'm gonna go. And it's not like, I know that sometimes I'm gonna fall and fail and I'm not gonna get there today, but I know where I'm going. It's like having, you know, our lives got so much more simple with Waze and Google Maps and that instead of getting lost and stopping at a service station and asking directions and taking the wrong on-ramp and the wrong off-ramp. Now you've got like your GPS when you have your mission statement. And when you do, you can feel so much more confident, fulfilled and have this like positive energy and that gets to how I came to the name Kutzpah Wisdom and Wine. So yeah, it's a catchy name, it's cute and everything, but it really, really, really defines my philosophy because 
If you want to have this personal mission statement in life, there's three essential ingredients to live a life with a personal mission statement. One is chutzpah. And chutzpah is not, you know, the first thing, especially South Africans, because we like so polite, we think of Israelis as rude, chutzpahdik Israelis. But when I think of chutzpah, I think of the other kind of chutzpah, the startup nation chutzpah. It's the lack of the fear of the word no. And that lack of the fear of the word no is incredibly powerful because that's okay. You can move ahead, you can take challenges. Chutzpah is also that permission to believe that tomorrow will be better. It's that permission to believe that you can control your own destiny to some degree. It's that permission to believe that change is possible. And the other essential ingredient of chutzpah is flexible. It doesn't help to write a mission statement and then be set on it for the rest of your life. It's about flexibility. It's about being honest. It's about seeing shortcomings, failings, and taking another turn, another direction. And that's truly what chutzpah is about. Wisdom, for me, is Torah knowledge. I think for everybody, I think that um, wisdom is slightly different. You know, if you're not Jewish, for us as Jews, wisdom is having Torah, they're constant. It's instead of like searching Rabbi Google, we search the Torah for these constant ancient messages of wisdom that can teach us no matter what and don't change with the trends of the day. And wine. So I'm famous for drinking lots of good red wine and I'm famous for making lots of times. Um, I think that wine to me, yes, it represents the spiritual aspect of life, but wine also is that ability to stop and reflect, to enjoy, because I think that as modern day parents, we spend our whole life in a rat race. Like I used to have a hamster that was in my office because my kids got it as birthday present and I nearly went to murder this thing. And it used to keep them up at night. So they put it in my office and it just like went in its wheel round and round and round and round. But sometimes that's just what we do. You know, we're going from like carpool to carpool to like shopping to Shabbat dinner to run around here, run around there. But when do we ever like stop and take time out to reflect, to think, to be, and to actually write our mission statement? So I believe if you have those ingredients and you put them to use, that's the ingredients for you as a person to be unstoppable and to build an unstoppable family. So with that, I'm more than happy to take questions from anyone. Um, you know, I'd love you guys to read my book, which has many different topics in it. This is not even a topic mentioned in my book. Um, you can get it from the Kalel Bookstore, um, as well as I'm happy to come speak to your schools, to your communities. And if you guys are ever in Jerusalem, um, we're famous for hosting very big Shabbat meals with lots of l'chaim. So I'd love to host you guys in my home as well. So thank you. Thank you, Jody. So we were speaking just uh, just before everybody came on that South Africans are, are quite shy. Um, in the chat, Jolene has put her cell phone number if anyone would prefer to send questions via Jolene. Um, but otherwise, please, um, please feel free to ask Jody questions on, on anything, on mindset, on, uh, on a special needs child, on the travels through, uh, through Australia, America, Israel, um, what good wines there are out there. <laughs> <laughs> Jody, yeah. someone asked in the chat, is your book on Kindle? So my book is, I mean, it's on Amazon as a, you, but you, you, I like, don't like saying Kindle because yes, it's on Kindle, but you don't have to have a Kindle. It can be read, read on any device on an Amazon ebook. So yes. And, um, you know, by all means, you should read it. And I just want to like mention, because one topic that always fascinates South Africans, because we've been to 87 countries with our children, kosher, shomer, shavas, and on a budget. So I think that 
that is for sure um, that's for sure a topic that is close to people. Um, and I'm happy to, I write a lot of blogs about all these topics and, you know, feel free to follow me on Instagram, Jody's Voice, on Facebook, and message me personally as well. Come on, Jopik. South Africans are always like the most shy people. Everybody else challenges you, like they're like, you know, but what this, but not South Africans. Hmm. I think we're just so accepting of, uh, of people that have the expertise in various areas. So maybe I'll start rounding it off. And if at any point in the next uh, three minutes, anyone has anything to say, please, please uh, butt in. So I started off uh, talking, is there somebody? You asked me, I have a question. Go for it, Andy, thank you. At least the one that made Aliyah is asking a question. <laughs> Lovely to see you here. I'm, I'm practicing, I'm practicing my chutzpah. <laughs> mm. um, I wanted to, and I forgot my question. Oh, um, I remembered it. Um, I mean, we, we spoke a lot about like a mission statement and obviously giving yourself a bit of focus and direction. Um, what kind of like workflow or process would you um, suggest to kind of go through the process of coming up with that work with that mission statement? Because obviously it's a very encompassing um, statement about the kind of person you want to be in the kind of life you want to live. So how would you recommend starting to go through that process? So the first thing you have to do is you have to think of what are your passions? Who are the people in your life? where your place is, like what place are you in? What opportunities do you have? And what's your personality? You know, it doesn't help to say, oh, you know, like I'm an extremely introverted person and I, like I'm gonna get out there and I'm gonna change the world by doing X. Like you've got to really have an honest conversation. Um, I think that you have to ask yourself and make a list. And then you have to say to yourself, where do I want to be? Like one of my favorite quotes, because a mission statement, I think that's the other thing that intimidates people. I think people think this mission statement has to be for your whole life. And just like a business plan is dynamic and you make a business plan and you change it according to things in your environment and situations that change. You know, if you were to ask me um, when I was like this young girl living in Johannesburg, did I ever think my children would be from, from birth New Yorkers? Um, with a sister with special needs, you know, like, and that I would be out there and speaking to us. And I, like, I mean, it was like the last thing, life changes. So you have to say to yourself, who do I want to be? Where do I want to be in 365 days from now? It's like such a good, and so you take those first questions and then ask yourself, where do you want to be 365 days from now? And you can, and then you start building your list of what's important to you. And you have to remember that it's what's important to you, not what you think is important to someone else, because that's when the dissonance comes in. Because I think sometimes people build these mission statements because they think my mom and dad want me to be successful. My husband wants me to be, you know, thin and beautiful, but that's not a mission statement. A mission statement has you in the end. It has, it's not, it's not, a mission statement's not about the journey, it's about the end goal. So you've got to be very clear what the end goal is. Not, because the journey changes along the way. You have to be very clear what the end goal is and you have to be able to put you in it. This is not about your mom. This isn't only about your kids. You have to be able to say like, I, Jody, want to be. Because that's part of writing a mission statement because it's who you stand for in a business. You don't, write a, you don't write a business plan and a mission statement for someone else's business. And I think people so often invest, it like always fascinates me, like people invest thousands of hours in job interviews, writing business plans, getting ready for board presentations. Um, they'll go to the gym, they'll do so many things. They even go to parenting classes and, you know, read up on things. But how many people actually think about themselves and put them in the center of it and invest in this process. So it's a time, it's honest questions, it's realistic evaluation and where you are in your life. 
and and then it's pulling it all together and making sure you understand because I think people get sidetracked by the journey and not the destination. I hope that answers. <laughs> Thanks, Jody. Anyone else? So maybe two things I'll just share to wrap up. So the first thing you referenced, Dr. Palkovitz, one of his uh, very powerful um, things, he came to South Africa a couple of times, he's been at Sinai and Daba and, and at various schools. And I remember, you know, he spoke, um, Jody, about how when parents are a certain way, the kids value those things. And one of the most powerful things I remember him speaking about is the concept of ethical fading. He said very often, uh, of course we teach our children never to lie, and yet when we go to Gold Reef City, we tell our five-year-old, just say you four um, to get in free. Or, yeah, I've heard him. or we swipe our, um, our cards at the gym without going in so we can get discovery points. And um, you know, in this time of Tikkun Amidot, really to maybe watch ourselves and it becomes so now I remember sitting at a at a meal once and I saw somebody going like this so you can't see with my silly background but like waving their fair their their phone up and down and I didn't understand what they were doing but again you know trying to get a coffee from discovery because they were moving um and <laughs> our, our kids um our kids notice all of this don't lie, but when we go to Gold Reef City, say you're four when you're five, or, you know, let me swipe my card at the gym, even though I'm, I'm not doing anything. And maybe that's, it, it was always something that, that stuck with me and, and you referenced him. And I think he's a very wise, uh, wise man. So maybe just one thing we can um, take from, from Dr. Pelkovitz. And the other thing that, that was very powerful for me when you were talking about that mission statement, um, I started off with the idea of the bridge. And we know, and I'm sure with your millions of guests that you have, no doubt you've sung the song, uh, that when we're walking on that narrow bridge of life, um, between the various chagim, between the various stages of our lives, between you know being a teenager and an adult, an adult and married, married and having children, children and, and the challenges that come, um, the ikar is not to fear. And I think that um, you, you've made that very clear and that's really the, the beginning of, um, of a true mission statement. Um, when one's on a bridge, um, one has to have wisdom. You can't, uh, especially if it's narrow, you can't uh, run too much. And especially, I don't know why, the, the swing bridge in Storms River comes to mind. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, we just got to stop and look at the magnificent view and uh, really see where we've come from, know where we're going and, 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 and you know, see life for what it is. So just uh, thank you at this very important time uh, in, in ER, as we, as we move towards Sivan, um, a time where COVID has, you know, we've, we've had an annual time of it, we're Baruch Hashem in Israel, uh, we're coming, are they coming out of it, South Africa, we're, we're not sure, we still have, have uh, ill people around. We're in South Africa, we're anticipating a third wave. And uh, just to really hold who we are in Bezrat Hashem in the, in the merit of us uh, holding our ethics strong, of us really um, in, a, in a very measured way and in a, in a, say, a mission way, um, really moving towards just establishing ourselves in a in a powerful way in this world for ourselves hopefully that will just leave us healthy emotionally spiritually and uh, we just thank you so much for for your for your beautiful talk tonight jody and wish you only everything of the best um we look forward to being your guests in jerusalem and tasting you're your wine. all invited you can never scare me you're all welcome <laughs> and i just want to once again just thank Jolene Swartz for her incredible efforts in, in getting the most wonderful speakers from all over the world and uh, allowing our Yeshiva College and Mizrahi community to just experience really awesome people from all over. I hope everybody enjoyed. Um, for whoever's here, please, we'd love some feedback. Um, tell us who else you want to hear. And Jody, just uh, lots of mazel and bracha ahead. And we look forward to, to hosting you in person, Bezrat Hashem, soon. And we look forward to good news from your parents. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, ladies. Thanks, everyone.